We hear that Momo met Roger, which is cool and all, but uh, Roger's been dead for the past two decades. So, um, what? Hello my fellow wannabe straw hats and welcome back to the One Piece Saga. Where today we have an arc that can only be described as Any's Lobby 2.0. Because sheesh, this one flipped literally everything upside down and I am all here for it. But let's not waste any more time and dive straight into Zo. Before we get to the story itself, I want to briefly talk about the arc in very very broad terms. Because it seriously got me by surprise in basically every sense of the word. Coming off of the almost 100% action ride that was Dressrosa, I was expecting a bit of a slower, more setup oriented arc. But I certainly didn't expect it to set up most of the endgame story in literally like 5 episodes. Amazon Lily, for example, was almost entirely focused on setting up Marineford. But compared to this, that almost seems like child's play in retrospect. Because here, we just learned of all the missing puzzles on our way to Raftel, not to mention all the history we got about Zoe and so, 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 so many other things. TLDR, this arc is incredibly dense and if I happen to brush over something, don't be too surprised. Because there is a ton I want to talk about here. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get stuck in. And before I get any further, I'll just say it right now. As soon as we heard of what this supposed island is, Zo instantly became one of my favorite locations we've seen to date. I mean, come on. You can't tell me the concept of an island on the back of a giant wandering elephant isn't just top tier fantasy, right? And that's not even mentioning the absolutely stunning views we got of Zo itself. Seriously, this shot we got later in the arc of Luffy just looking at the whale tree might be one of my favorite views in the entire series so far. Everything about this location just oozed in personality, and I genuinely loved every second we spent here. And in a weird way, I am almost glad that we didn't stick around because I feel like that air of mystery around this entire location is one that shouldn't be solved. Though, because this is me we're talking about, a whale-shaped tree did immediately begin to make my theory-making cog spin. Because, you know, fruits grow on trees, right? And this appears to be a very curious-looking tree. So, could it also harbor some very curious fruits, perhaps of the devil variety? Who knows? And another thing worth noting here is that all the lore we get isn't just on the Straw Hats front. Because we also cut around to the rest of the world to learn of many many other things happening both in response to the events of Dressrosa, as well as some big shots making their own moves. First off, we meet one of the new warlords, Edward Weevil, who claims to be Whitebeard's biological son and is basically going around wiping out the ex-Whitebeard crew. And I'll say it right now, this dude looks like a bit of a weird boy and a wild card, so I legitimately have no clue how he might play into basically any of what we see. Especially, like I also said last time, with Fujitora wanting to dismantle the entire warlord system as is. So that then makes me ask, if it's going away anyway, why is he introduced now? I guess only time will tell, but as of right now, I really have no idea. The only potential idea I have is him joining up with Blackbeard to sort of invert the whole Blackbeard joining Whitebeard thing. Though I admit, this is completely baseless and I have nothing to go off of. Next up, we cut to Jesus, who has apparently followed Sabo right back to Baltigo. And while that in and of itself is of course massive, we also hear that something called Drunken Iron Ore was found in the weapons from Dressrosa. Considering it is once again just a throwaway line and we literally never hear it mentioned again, I'm guessing this is something we'll hear about more in around 500 episodes. Though because it was pointed out so explicitly, I do wonder what makes it so notable. Perhaps it's the material that the legendary grade swords are forged out of? Perhaps it's strong enough to withstand sea prism? Maybe it's a material required to construct the ancient weapon? Honestly, at this point it could truly be anything, so I'm just dying to see what's so important about it. And finally, we cut to Buggy. My hate for him is well known at this point, so High Rudin just showing up and saying that they quit was excellent. All of you Buggy stands, feel free to come at me. Cutting back to the crew, it was already here that I noticed something quite peculiar, and that was Robin's attitude throughout this entire arc. 
I don't know if this is just me, but has she become much more at peace and just happy? Honestly, every time she spoke up in this arc, I just found myself smiling. That mix of her almost morbid realism and that nonchalant nature of presenting said morbid realism was just excellent. And there were so many examples of this too. We get the whole, hey it's cute, when talking about those very derpy drawings. We then get the recurring cannibals joke and many others. And while I won't obviously list off every case of this, I do want to bring just one example up. Way, way later in the arc, they're talking about Marco, and with Luffy being Luffy, he obviously doesn't remember him. And that's when Robin speaks up casually saying, he looks like a pineapple, and Luffy just immediately recognizes him. It was genuinely excellent. I think I've made it pretty clear by now that Robin has always been high up there among my favorite straw hats, and it's these small changes in her personality that we see that just reinforce that statement. With all the messed up things she's been through, it's just nice to see that she can finally drop her guard and just laugh it up among her very wacky friends. Unlike someone on our crew, her character isn't just static. It's continuously evolving and changing. So yes, Robin in this entire arc is just perfect. Though when it comes to the story, aside from reuniting with her crew, obviously the most important character in this one is the supposed ninja Raizo. I'll be the first to admit that I was very much sharing the crew's excitement of meeting a ninja because hey, ninjas are cool. Though what I absolutely have to mention here is the journey the crew has to take to get up to Zo, because this one genuinely had me laughing out loud the most of the way through. I'd imagine that the anime stretched this out compared to the manga, but man, the comedic timing because it was just like 10 minutes of them trying to get up and falling down and monkeys falling and everything else just going wrong was excellent. And how could I not mention the extremely over-dramatized death of the legendary dragon Ryunosuke? The full-on sentimental music kicking in, then the echo and him appearing in the sky? Only for all of that to be sharply cut off as we see Law and Zoro just be like, this is absurd. It was comedy gold, and considering all the revelations we get later on, this arc definitely needed that levity. But uh, am I the only one who legit felt bad for Ryunosuke? Though as we make it to the island itself, we soon discover that something has gone terribly wrong, as most of the buildings are pretty severely damaged already. Oh, and by the way, you have no clue how comedically wrong I was. I thought that the crew was chased down by Big Mom, Zo got wiped out in the chase, and they just fled even further somehow. Obviously, that was utterly wrong. But anyway, before we get to their reunion, I want to talk about the Mink's ability, Electro. This is another curious one, as I kind of expected to hear more about why it's even a thing. I mean, electricity and animal humans aren't really as natural of a match as fishmen and underwater combat, right? Though, just like the drunken ore we heard of before, it's never really talked about much. So, I suppose it's just an innate ability they have? I kind of have a hard time believing that, since I'd imagine Oda would lead into the world building aspect of them being able to leverage something as powerful as electricity. With what would transpire later in the arc, perhaps we'll get to hear more about their history, but as of right now, as with many things in this arc, the whole electro technique just left me asking many a question. Because yeah, electricity coming from her hands, that sounds like the Industrial Revolution. But with that, let's get to our crew's reunion, which I fully expected to be a fun time as we look forward to our next major mission. But oh boy, it was anything but that. I won't lie, that shot of Nami just throwing herself into Luffy's arms really gave me pause. Because clearly, something had gone terribly, terribly wrong. Again, they were chased by a literal emperor, and with the skeleton crew they had, no pun intended, clearly they couldn't have put up even the tiniest of a fight. So I do admit, for a split second, yes, I genuinely thought Sanji might be gone. Like, gone gone. And while that clearly wasn't the case, and I'm sort of ashamed for even thinking that, I still think that the sudden turn in emotion here was awesome and certainly set up an air of spookiness for everything to come next, since we'd now be dealing with some of the most powerful people in the world. Like, literally two emperors. The last time we saw two emperors was Marineford, and we all know how that ended. Though, because this is One Piece, we'd of course not even get an explanation of what happened to Sanji right away, as we just cut to the crew all partying. 
Obviously, this confirmed that Sanji is most definitely not dead, but all drama aside, I just absolutely adored the vibe of Zou. This'll be an extremely specific reference, but if you've played Battle for Bikini Bottom, Zou seriously reminded me of that jungle level in terms of theme. The almost tropical and upbeat music was top draw and, as I said before, this arc just oozes in personality and I genuinely loved every second of it. Though, skipping ahead a little, we learn of the two kings who, from now on, I will refer to as Cat King Boy and Dog King Boy. We learn since the two kings fight like cat and dog, they split their duties into two parts. Dog King Boy would be king of the day, while Cat King Boy would rule during the nighttime. And as such, basically their entire kingdom now operated under two different schedules. I hope you get used to this because I'll say it a lot in this arc, but again, just an incredibly unique theme that we haven't seen yet. And again, I was fully on board to learn more about them. But before we do, we finally hear what exactly happened here to cause the level of destruction that we saw earlier. We hear that Jack, the right hand of Kaido, so yes, another emperor is thrown into the mix, was after Raizo, the ninja we are also here to meet. And so, 17 days ago, his raid began. We essentially hear that no matter how much they fought back, Jack never wavered. And so, once the fight turned to days, Dog King Boy and Cat King Boy basically began to tag team him. After 5 days, however, Jack couldn't fight anymore, but because he is the right hand of Kaido, it's not like he'll go down easy. And so, he unleashed a poisonous gas made by Caesar and supplied by none other than our favorite glasses-wearing gentleman, Dofi. And with that, the fight ended instantly and began the not-so-humane interrogations. As far as villain introductions go, this was definitely up there. I mean, he is a literal mammoth with a billion-plus bounty, which just makes me concerned about what Kaido is capable of if this is just one of his subordinates. And during this entire thing, we also hear of what happened to Sanji. Though before we talk about that, can I just say how happy I am to see Capone back in the story? The dude's power and overall vibe was hands down one of my favorites in Sabaody, so I'm glad that he's being brought back into the story, even if he is a very, very, very bad dude. Though yes, it's here that we get into some huge Sanji lore, because he is apparently being forced into an organized marriage by his family. So, I suppose I was semi-right with what I said last time, because yeah, we only know of Sanji's past after he was inexplicably already on a ship working as a cook. And I suppose this also answers that one throwaway line about Sanji being born in the North Blue we got way way back in Jaya, right? Because I distinctly remember him casually saying that he was born in the North. And with what we know of the world now, getting to the East Blue clearly wouldn't have been a simple task. I mean, he'd have to cross the Red Line, so what's up with that? And in a broader sense, this entire sequence of him basically being held at gunpoint by Capone as he makes Big Mom's commands clear was awesome, and was certainly quite a bit different from all the confrontations we've seen in the past. Obviously with Capone being your most stereotypical mafia boss, that's also a major through line here, and frankly, I couldn't be happier about it, I love his vibe. Though I do admit, the scene of Sanji telling them that he never meant to hide anything did almost make me feel bad for him since there is clearly some serious underlying trauma there. And then that note he left also hit me in the feels but just a teeny bit. I guess my point is, I am cautiously optimistic. For those of you who have been following the series for a long time, my ever-increasing dislike for Sanji is well documented. So I know you're probably looking forward to this. And while yes, he obviously pulls some very noble moves here, as of right now, it's no more than a teensy tiny step toward any sort of redeemal in my eyes. This entire situation is evoking a lot of the same narrative beats that we saw with Robin, but the thing is, I didn't actively hate Robin like I do Sanji. In fact, going into Water 7 and Eni's lobby, she was one of my favorite characters. So unfortunately, Sanji is starting with quite a few points behind as is. At the same time, family drama is always top tier content because literally all of us can relate to it at least to some degree. And considering how much my thoughts change with Usopp after Water 7, I seriously have very, very high expectations going into his story, so we'll see how all that plays out. 
So again, I'm cautiously optimistic, but you ain't pulling some cheap emotion bombs with me, Sanji. You've got a lot, and I mean a lot, to make up for. Soon thereafter, we get to meet Cat King Boy, where the entire story of Jack's attack is continued, and some other details regarding Sanji's family of assassins are dropped. Oh, and by the way, Luffy just forgetting about Kinemon during all of this is top-tier comedy. Though regarding Cat King Boy, he seriously gave me Nino Kuni vibes, mostly because there's also a huge Cat King there. But I seriously loved this guy. The whole sequence of him constantly just wanting to mess around while Chopper screams at him to rest was some good old slapstick humor, and again, a nice bit of levity after the downright gruesome events we had just witnessed with Jack's attack. And since we are talking about cats and dogs, I'll just say that Cat King Boy is cooler than Dog King Boy and cats are generally cooler than dogs, don't at me. Though it's then that we get to what no joke might be among the greatest plot twists in One Piece yet. Because I will tell you right now, I literally saw none of this coming. Not the slightest, teeny tiniest suspicion. Nothing. We see Dog King Boy and Cat King Boy almost cross paths, which would of course mean a fight between the two. And just as they lock weapons, Kinemon and Momo finally make it to the square and scream out for the fight to stop. And just like that, literally everything we knew is flipped upside down, because Kinemon announces who he is. And just like that, that escalating music cuts to silence as they all bow. I genuinely cannot put into words what my reaction here was like. Everything, and I mean everything, just fell away. With everything we'd seen and the levels of brutal torture we saw, I never thought Raizo was actually here. But he was. All along, these people never gave an inch. And that scene of all of that bottled up emotion coming out as they say that they've been expecting them? You have no clue how much I wish I had my reaction recorded for this. Because genuinely, I think my jaw actually dropped and I was just covered in goosebumps. Many of you might think I'm exaggerating, but no. I don't know if I just totally missed the plot or what, but this reveal just blasted every other one out of the park by a long shot. Dragon's Luffy's dad, yeah, cool, but the silly samurai dude and his supposed son actually commanding an entire army, none of whom ever broke under the fist of an emperor? Wow. And then just hearing that Momo is actually a lord? What? Everything in the sequence was just genuinely perfect. The confusion and chaos among the crew, the music building anticipation in the background, the united forces of Zo suddenly marching forwards, all contrasted by Kinemon calmly making his announcement. And then that cuts to silence as an entirely different tinge of music kicks in. Perfection. And the way we share that complete shock with the Straw Hats, I am sorry if I'm coming across as a mess just gushing about everything here, but that's because I am. If I had to rank singular scenes, this is genuinely top 10, if not top 5 material. In my mind, this is up there with the likes of Nami's Help Me, Zoro's I Will Never Lose Again, Chopper Flying the Flag, and many of the other legendary shots. Do let me know if this is a common sentiment or not, because man, this was just incredible. Oh, and then the follow-up scene we get is just precious. Luffy is obviously just a tad confused as to what is going on here. Usopp's just glad they didn't get into a fight. Brook is, well, Brook, it's kind of hard to tell what he's feeling. And Nami is just peacefully looking on as the unbreakable spirit of Zoe has finally paid off. Okay, and one last thing, the musical switch to that almost mystical and foreign feel is excellent. And basically what I'm saying here is that everyone who was involved in this scene should get an immediate raise. Oh, and by the way, with Momo being an heir to Wano's throne, Luffy once again got an ally in royalty, just saying. Okay, and this time for sure one last thing. Another thing I feel like is worth mentioning is who Momo actually unites here. Yes, as we've seen, the joint spirit of Zo is clearly unbreakable. But here, he is literally uniting a cat and a dog. They are polar opposites. That's how strong the message and meaning of his 
I guess, return is. Needless to say, I cannot wait to find out more about their story and Odin and everything else to do with them. Alright, enough gushing for now. And yes, for now, because there will be plenty more. Following all of that craziness, we finally make our way to meet the legendary ninja Raizo. And oh boy, did I get a good laugh out of it. Obviously, we've been led to believe that this ninja will be some legendary warrior with power beyond this world, so obviously once he's revealed to be basically a Jojo character, the crew is disappointed, and for some reason, this just really hit a funny bone for me. Just the sheer ridiculousness of the situation, and then everyone bugging him about doing ninja moves, again, it just worked nicely to contrast the very, very dark nature of everything we'd seen so far. And now, at this point, I obviously thought we'd already gotten our share of reveals, but no, not even close. Because it's here that we basically get the key that would take us to Raftel, one of the four road poneglyphs that, when combined, will give you the location of the final island. Now, the only question I have is whether this whole crossing them thing is for the sake of visuals, or is that how it really works? Because technically speaking, you can triangulate a location with just three points of reference. I'm assuming that for the whole crossing the lines thing to work, the road poneglyphs would have to oppose one another. So if we were to have three of them, two of them would have to naturally cross, and because we have the third, which by definition has to cross the line, we can find Raftel technically without the fourth. Even Chopper points this out, but Nami says that they'll need the fourth, which is obviously shooting this theory down before it even gets off the ground. Though that then makes me wonder, why? The easy answer would be of course that this is the Grand Line and better yet the New World. We've already seen that logic here doesn't really apply, so maybe triangulation simply isn't possible and you need the exact coordinates as spelled out by the Poneglyphs to reach it. Though with that said, indulge me in a little bit of tinfoil. Because what if there are four kinds of coordinates and each of the road poneglyphs lists only one? But oh, I hear you ask. I've played Minecraft and there's only three, X, Y, and Z. Where's the fourth? Well, what about time? What if Raftel is similar to Zoe? It doesn't stand still, so in order to find it, or rather catch it, you need to be able to predict where it will be, not where it is at the moment. So yeah, you could technically triangulate its location, but since you'd have to still look for it, you simply wouldn't be able to catch it. And that's not even accounting for the fact that it might be at the bottom of the ocean, you know, maybe Davy Jones is chilling there. Or maybe it's a sky island and the time dimension is for a knock-up stream of sorts. And actually, if Oda was to be even more cheeky, who says that the road poneglyphs mark the ends of the lines? Because of the illustration given to us, that is what we assume. But what if they are merely establishing two points to make a line, and those lines cross way outside of those bounds? Point is, there clearly must be an explicit reason as to why we need the fourth, and I just want to find out why. Because we now obviously know where the three of them are already. And considering both are held by emperors, it's pretty clear that we are very much entering the endgame of the story, and I'm kind of sad about that. But anyway, as if all of that wasn't enough, we also hear that Raftel isn't actually the final island per se, because it actually lies beyond the Grand Line. It's the reason why you need the four road poneglyphs to begin with. Which also makes me wonder whether we will actually conquer the Grand Line itself or head straight for Raftel. I suppose the easy answer would be that the final poneglyph lies on the final island, so we'd have to do both. But at the same time, I can't help but feel like this is the perfect way to set up that Blackbeard confrontation, because if he were to possess the final one, we'd have an explicit reason to go after him which would be very much big hype. Unless... What if Luffy meets Blackbeard on the final island, and that's where we also get the final Poneglyph? Make it happen, Oda. Oh, and also, the emotional and almost somber music juxtaposed by the shock of the Straw Hats in this scene was just top-notch direction. Obviously, such a revelation is a absolutely massive deal, and the epic, larger-than-life music signals that. But just like the Straw Hats, all of us had that, wait, what? Raftel isn't that far anymore moment? And Luffy fulfills that role for us as the audience. Though another thing we see here that seriously has me scratching my head is what we hear of Odin and the Roger Pirates. First off, I don't even know what the f to think about this, 
We hear that Momo met Roger, which is cool and all, but uh, Roger's been dead for the past two decades. So um, what? Unless our boy Momo has been shrunk down to a kid again, or he's a time traveler, this seems very wrong. Could it be that there's a fruit power which reverses a human's lifespan and returns them to a kid? That is possible, I suppose. Bonnie had a very similar ability, so there is some basis there. Could it be that Momo is actually immortal because the previous wielder of the Op-Op fruit gave him maternal youth? Also possible, though he doesn't appear to be an adult in a kid's body, so I don't think that's the case either. Regardless, this is once again a throwaway line that isn't even lingered on. So yeah, guess we'll hear more in 500 episodes? Though the other major question I have is Rayleigh's line way way back in Sabaody, because there he said that they never deciphered the writings. Though, based on what we heard here, Odin must have been the one to both transcribe Roger's messages and to read the Poneglyphs themselves. So, why did Rayleigh lie? I mean, he explicitly said we were pirates, we never read them. It's not even a, though we did have some help, or something like that which would indicate that they would still be going the same route as Luffy is going. And then that line about Roger just hearing the voice of the universe to find Roftel further confirmed that they didn't fully understand the writings. Which again, is obviously not the case. So, what's the deal with that? I mean, yeah, Robin obviously said that she doesn't want to find out all of its secrets. But still, why would Rayleigh lie about this? Is this a retcon of sorts? It just seems like a weird thing not to mention. I mean, he never had to say that it was Odin, right? He could have just said, well, we read them, and that's it. But anyway, the last major thing we hear is that Momo's dad did indeed make it to Raftel, and that is the reason why Kaido tortured him and ultimately executed him. I'll be honest, the entire timeline here has me profusely scratching my head, so I'm just waiting for the obligatory flashback to get a better idea of how this whole thing actually went down. Because right now, some shenanigans are afoot. I mean, at this point, Momo could literally be lying and just be some rando. He said he met Roger. That is literally not possible. Alright, reveals aside, we get to what is another S-tier scene in the entire series. As the Ninja Pirate Mink Samurai Alliance is formed with the goal of defeating the Shogun of Wano and Emperor Kaido. And man, the scene between Luffy and Momo here is something else entirely. Just how quickly Luffy snaps into that serious captain again, refusing their alliance and telling Momo that if he is their lord, he must speak for himself, was simply excellent. It's scenes like these that really remind you that as much as Luffy is a goofball, his EQ is incredibly high, and there is a good reason why he is the captain of this crew. Everyone else is just captivated by the size of the Alliance and doesn't see the deeper meaning in establishing it. Luffy, on the other hand, doesn't care that Momo is a young kid. And as much as that may seem cruel, it's clear that it is just out of respect. In his eyes, if Momo really is to be Wano's leader, he needs to start making decisions for himself. Yes, he is traumatized. But if he can do that, then it's better for him to step down right away instead of getting burned sometime later on. And man, that scene of Luffy crouching down and offering him his hand after Momo makes his proclamation, literal perfection. And even the deeper significance of this scene. Literally most of the story so far has been about the old generation handing down the mantle to Luffy, who of course signifies the new generation. Well here, Luffy is already the older one making way for the young. And just like the wiser old dudes we've seen before, he didn't make it easy. I'm sorry, I love Zo and I'll keep gushing about it, okay? Though, all's not well, because suddenly, Momo and Luffy are overcome by a voice in their heads asking for an order. And right as we see that, it is revealed that Jack has also returned. And while it's clearly a pretty major deal, I'll just cut to the part where he is obliterated by the elephant because hey, <coughs> Jack am I right? Alright, jokes aside, there is a ton to unpack here. First off, we hear that the reason why the elephant begged for an order to begin with is because they had committed a crime sometime long ago and was destined to walk the ocean forever to repay said crime. Obviously, this immediately prompts the question of what could that be? And better yet, I mean, look at it, it's massive. Meaning that anyone who could command it around and have sway strong enough to sentence it for literally its entire life must be magnitude stronger. 
I do have some theories that big surprise connected to Joy Boy, since he too had to make apologies for unfulfilled promises, so perhaps there is some link there? Maybe way back during the Void Century, Joy Boy and the Elephant were close allies and it intended to move the ship Noah, and because that didn't happen, they had to repay their debts? At this point, it could be anything, but as with most things we've seen post time skip, it's clear that there is a ridiculous amount of history that we are still completely clueless about. So, I'm just waiting for that flashback yet again. Secondly, there's its eye. Because does it remind you of anything? Yup, that is the same distinct double circle pupil that Hawkeye has. So, absolutely crazy theory time here. Could Hawkeye be from the Void Century? Before you ask, yes, I will mention it literally everywhere until we finally see it happen, because there has got to be a reason for the introduction of Law's immortality surgery. And if the elephant is like a millennia old, and it just so happens to have the same distinct pupil that Hawkeye has, might there be a connection there? It would also make the whole vampire vibe that Hawkeye's has make much more sense, since he would be living seemingly forever. And on top of that, he is the only warlord we've ever seen without a crew. So maybe he became a warlord because he once had a crew. I've got about 50,000 more theories and something tells me most of them are completely wrong, so let's move on. Using what I guess has to be the same voice of the universe, Momo makes it whack Jack's fleet, and that is the end of that. Though the only question I have is this. At the end of the arc, Jack is alive at the bottom of the ocean and is unable to move. And, um, how is he alive? Obviously the curse of the fruit is affecting him since he can't move, but how is he alive? Could he be a fishman and just be able to breathe underwater? Or maybe immortality, perhaps. Hmm. With all that out of the way, we begin drawing up plans for all of our upcoming missions, of which there are many. In short, the Alliance splits up into four teams. Luffy's squad would go after Sanji. Cat King Boy would contact Marco, who, by the way, got defeated by Blackbeard, and that's why he became an emperor. Kinemon and the others would already set off for Wano, and Dog King Boy would stay behind with Momo. As for us, obviously retrieving old Curly Eyebrow is our top priority. So, Big Mom's Island does appear to be next. Oh, and literally everyone wanting to go with Luffy also gave me a very, very good laugh. Though another thing we see here is God Usopp upgrading Nami's Climate Act. So, that is probably a big level up for her just in time for our Big Mom fight. Especially with her just casually throwing around lightning now. Considering her power we already saw back in Return to Sabaody, I'm guessing friendly lightning god Nami will make a return in full force. Though with that, they pack up to leave, and we get what might just be the best island exit of all time, as Luffy just yoinks his squads and jumps off of the elephant, literally free-falling to the ground. Luffy never stop being Luffy. One of the last things we see here seriously caught me off guard, because we suddenly cut to Alabasta and Vivi. Number one, it's about time, and number two, we hear that they are headed to the Reverie. So now the only question I'm left asking is, are we seriously going to meet up with everyone again? There is no way the reverie is just going to happen in peace. The Straw Hats have to crash it somehow, right? I need to see them reunite with Vivi, Kureha, and all the others we've met throughout the journey, so please make it happen, Oda. Oh, and side note, all the kids wearing Straw Hats back in Dressrosa is a very nice small detail. Though speaking of Kureha, we see someone who we also met way back in Drum Island, Wapal. If you remember my initial thoughts on him, you probably expect that I'm going to dunk on him about literally every single thing we see here, right? But no, his story is actually pretty cool. I literally hated every single thing about him back when we first met him, but now that all the seriousness surrounding him as a villain is gone, the super comedy heavy catch up with him was incredible and I just found myself laughing the entire way through. Just the sheer ridiculousness of him accidentally becoming this huge toy maker is top tier One Piece shenanigans. And believe it or not, I am curious to see how their meeting with Luffy might actually go again. Though returning to our crew, we soon learn that Carrot, who I don't think I've mentioned once yet but TLDR she's awesome, has also snuck onto the ship. She has a teensy bit of straw hat energy, but I'll go out on a limb and say right now that I don't think she'll become a straw hat and just be a temporary ally. 
Though that aside, Pedro and her have an incredible dynamic, so I'm super excited to see how their story develops in these coming arcs. I should have definitely talked about the Matad more in this one, but I'm guessing I'll have ample opportunity to do that later, so TLDR, both of them are very cool. And yes, I do wish they were straw hats, but I just don't think they will be. Also, with all curly eyebrow missing, we are of course down our chef. Which, of course, means the obligatory Luffy cooking scene where, as you'd expect, the madman almost burns down the entire ship, and that's the end of that. A very poetic start to fighting for our chef, that's for sure. Oh, and we also see Luffy finally learn that Dragon is his father and learn of basically everything going on in Baltigo, but this just seems like setup, so I won't get into that too much now. Something big obviously went down, so I just can't wait to see what that was. And the very, very last thing we see in this arc is actually way over at Kaido's place, because we see that Captain Kid has been taken prisoner by him. Considering their initial target was Shanks, I'm guessing they never even got far enough to fight him and were captured by Kaido in that scene we saw back in Dressrosa. But regardless, curious to see how he ended up here and whether he'll be coming back into the bigger story as well. Considering that Capone is already playing a big role in the Emperor's part of the story, maybe the rest of the worst generation will also begin to pop up, but I suppose only time will tell. And that is Zo. A 20 episode arc that still turned out to be like 40 minutes long, so you should probably have a good idea of what my ranking will look like. Clearly, I loved every second of this arc in basically every sense of the word, so I'll shoot it right up to A tier, just above Dressrosa. And frankly, I would put it even higher if it wasn't such a short and setup oriented arc. So yeah, basically a post and ease lobby situation. For this one more than ever, I seriously hope we return to Zoa at some point because I just adored this setting so, so much. Though, with all that said, now it is full sail ahead to Big Mom's home turf as we fight to get Sanji back in Whole Cake Island. And that's the video. I am like 700 episodes deep into One Piece, but yet again, I did not expect this video to turn out as long as it did, but here we are. Though, with that said, as usual, I want to give a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!